Welcome to the Life Unlimited Podcast with Larry Heller. You deserve complete financial advice so you can confidently live your life your way for life. Now, let's get into this week's podcast episode. Welcome to Life Unlimited with Larry Heller from Heller Wealth Management. Larry, how are you today? I'm doing terrific, Eric. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. 63 63 degrees in New York today, Eric. Okay. (laughs) You really want to start off with a fight, Larry? It was negative one when I woke up this morning, and it's negative four right now. So, oh, no, no, positive Uh, four. We are in the positive today. Yeah, that's why I wanted to bring it up. I'm sure. So yesterday I was sure. yesterday I was on a Zoom with someone in Florida and they told me it was 86. So oh. everything's well, we could, relative. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I know you have a guest on the show today. Can I introduce the guest? Sure, absolutely. Are they in the tropics by any chance? Oh, okay. Now we'll, we'll No, I'm in the New, I'm in New York, but uh, right. <laughs> I share his sentiment as well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, audience, as you know, this is Stephen Brodsky. Stephen is a litigation and corporate partner with Mazzola Lindstrom LLP in New York City. He represents private companies, business owners, and executives in their business dealings and disputes. His practice is a mix of outside general counsel representation, transactional work, and complex commercial litigation. He spent the first half of his career in big law and has practiced for over 25 years. Outside of his practice, he serves in leadership positions both in American Bar Association and New York State Bar Association. Stephen is also the author of a chapter in a recently published book, discussing fiduciary duty claims involving investment advisors and other financial professionals. Larry, that is a heck of a bio. Obviously, you brought him on to have a great discussion. What are you guys talking about today? Well, we're going to talk about the, uh, the F word, fiduciary. Oh, so, yeah. uh, so, Stephen, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on as a guest. Uh, why don't we go get right into it? So why did you write about the financial professional? Yes, thank you, Larry, for having me. And... Um... I wrote about it because of the confusion that I feel is in the marketplace. You know, there are so many names that financial professionals have and retail investors, frankly, are confused. And I was confused. And so I wanted to look into it and find out what are the differences, if any, amongst these various professionals, whether they're investment advisors, um, financial advisors, uh, wealth managers and so forth. That was really the reason. Yeah, so let's just talk about some of the differences here, because I couldn't agree with you more that the average person is very confused. So wh- why specifically kind of investment advisors and, and broker dealers? Sure. Um, well, they're, the, they're on the opposite poles of the spectrum. Uh, but to, just to turn to the confusion again a little bit, uh, someone who is not an attorney, if they don't have a, a license to practice law, they cannot say, that they are an attorney. Same thing with a CPA, same thing with a doctor. But again, in the uh, marketplace for financial professionals, um, by and large, there is an amalgam of these various terms. Um, an investment advisor is actually a technical term under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. And a broker dealer, a broker is someone else uh, which with different duties. And so, you, Larry, as you know, you're an investment advisor and we have spoken and, and you feel very strongly about the fiduciary role of an investment advisor. And I wanted to also look into the, those bifurcated duties, which would be the fiduciary duties of an investment advisor on one hand and the non-fiduciary duties or contractual duties of a broker or a broker. So let me interrupt you there for a second, Steve, before we sure. kind of go delve into that. Why yeah. don't we just tell the audience because a lot of people really, surprisingly, they don't know what it is a fiduciary. So why sure. don't you kind of explain what a fiduciary is? Sure. It's not surprising. I mean, look, it's a legal term. And uh, in straightforward terms, a fiduciary is someone who is obligated to put uh, another's interests ahead of their own. And so what that means is if it's in the interest of that other entity or person, the fiduciary is obligated to do what's in that interest, even if it's to the detriment, if you will, of the fiduciary in the role. And so when you say obligated, when you say obligated, you mean legally obligated, legally obligated. That's absolutely correct. And so um, the, the the easiest example 
you know, there are many examples, but the easiest co that comes to mind is a trustee, let's say, of a trust. There are beneficiaries of the trust. The trustee is legally obligated to take acts at, in, the, in the interest of the beneficiaries of the trust. And likewise, and that uh, it's, it's akin, I'll even give another example, an attorney. You know, the law says that our, our duties to our clients is akin to a fiduciary. Uh, so for example, to give a real world example, I can't advise my client to take a course of action and I shouldn't if, if, it's, if it's to generate fees for myself, right? And if it's not in my client's interest, I'm obligated, aside from the fact that this is the way I practice law, to do what's in my client's interest. And if it's to do something which results in lower fees to me, so be it. And it, likewise, there are many others that way. A doctor, in a way, it has uh, that type of uh, obligation and role with regard to the patient. And, and so as we'll talk about, investment advisors like yourself are the same. Right. So, so an uh, investment advisor um, is governed by the SEC, like myself, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our clients. But that differs from a broker through a broker-dealer, correct? Absolutely. And I think it's important for the public to understand this. I think that um, even though you and I might differ on whether it, whether um, financial professionals should all have fiduciary duties or not, what there should definitely be is clarity. That when an investor comes in, that they should know clearly what the obligations and the role of the person or the entity that they're talking to. So when they come into your office, Larry, I know this because of our relationship, they certainly know uh, the way that you are to handle their uh, financial affairs. And, uh, but to but put that in contrast, I, 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 wanna, I don't wanna get too technical, but a broker, a broker is someone who trades on the account for another. A dealer is someone, is an entity as well, that trades on their own account. That's why the words broker dealer come, come into play because sometimes they're both, but we can say a broker or a broker dealer. Those uh, persons don't have that obligation. And to get slightly technical, they have an obligation of to follow the best interest of their customer or their client. And we can get into the weeds about that a little bit, if you you know, if you'd like, what that means. Well, it, I mean, that's really we'll get into that, but that's really my biggest concern. I can't tell you how many people come to me, and they work for, with a big brokerage firm, and I try to explain to them that we're a fiduciary, and they're like, no, that they were a fiduciary. They had to do what's right for me, and so the layperson doesn't really know <clears throat> what that what that is. So let's talk a little bit about, in practical terms, what does a fiduciary mean? Sure. What a fiduciary means in putting into practice, Larry, in the financial realm, let's, let's go there, mm -hmm. um, is, as you know, and if you are to recommend an investment or a portfolio investments or a plan, it's taking what your client has told you what they believe is um, their investment profile, their what their wants, what their status is, and and their financial and life status. Uh, hypothetically, let's say uh, it's actually not hypothetical because we have what's going the market turbulence as we are speaking just right now. And I am sure if one of your clients or many of them are calling you and saying, "Larry, sell everything," I am, and you know it's not in their interest um, long term. Uh, let's say if they're at the nearing retirement, um, and you know that uh, hypothetically, if you were to get a fee from the sale and so forth based on commissions, even if that were the case, you it would be against their interest if you were to say to them, sure, absolutely. Rather, as your fiduciary, you would try to help them uh, see that this is not in their interest, maybe if you've given their investment horizon and so forth. But we know that your financial structure is not even tied to that. But that's an example. Someone with a non-fiduciary obligation, let, let's say a broker, their obligations, which are set by the SEC as well, 
maybe just to disclose everything that, well, if you, if you sell, uh, and if we purchase this product, I, uh, I, and my, my company will get X percent commission. I recommend this other product and I have to, and I, and I'll, I'm obligated to tell you customer, I'll get a higher commission if I sell you that product or have you invest, but I believe it's also a good product. So it's a little bit different there. It's a matter of disclosure to the client. So this is kind of a little bit where we, we, we may disagree a little little bit maybe. So I, I just think it's way too confusing. I mean, me personally, we kind of use it as a differentiator when we're talking to clients and say, hey, listen, you're working with somebody who's got a legal obligation and a fiduciary obligation. It's much different than someone who's just got to do something that's suitable for you. But from a a lay person, they shouldn't have to even know that there's a difference. Everybody should be a fiduciary. It's like being an attorney and some attorneys don't have to practice the law. It, 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 makes no sen- it makes no sense to me why not every financial advisor needs to govern this. And you know, we're a CFP, so a certified financial planner. So we, it's another whole set of limits we have to do. But setting, even if you're not a CFP, why shouldn't everybody have to have a fiduciary fiduciary responsibility? That's a great question. And as I wrote about in my chapter, I actually cite an expert from the Bates Group, uh, Bates Consulting Group, uh, which is a group of experts that, among other things, focus on the financial industry. And uh, I, I quote Sheila Murphy, who cites a study that was done in England. Now, in which case, England at that time had banned commission-based advice, which is the equivalent or nearly the equivalent of saying all advice, financial advice has to be given uh, either on a percentage of, of asset under management compensation or a flat fee. And at least what happened in England at that time was uh, a number of financial professional entities couldn't were priced out. They left the market, and as a result, at least as the study concluded, there was a quote investment advisor gap, so that certain people were left without any professional advice. And this is where you and I talked about that, where you said, and I think it's a valid point because I haven't seen any study to the otherwise, which you said. Well, that was England. That was then. Today's world, I think it's. You can say what you what you told me the other day. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think that would easily fill the gap, especially now when everything uh, technology could be anywhere. And I've seen it. I there are firms out there that work with. Um, I'm going to say the mass affluent who just need some planning. Um, we've referred clients to these these firms. Now they're they're fiduciaries. So that's the reason that we refer them to that. And there are a lot of people out there that are that are very comfortable. Some of them work from home. Some of them work on an office on an hourly basis, hourly basis, and just do uh, planning on either an hourly rate or a fee rate. So I don't I don't see it. Um, well, that's a valid it. point. That that is a completely valid point. It, it, you know, I have yet uh, to see. A study one way or the other in the United States at this juncture, and as we know through technology right now, I mean the way that I practice law just through this unfortunate pandemic has changed. It used to take me two hours, let's say, if I had a court appearance, that I would have to charge my client traveling to and from court. Now I can literally, uh, essentially, press a button and save my client money. And so I don't disagree with you. I haven't seen anything. Yep. And, and a few years ago, so I, it still has to do to me with politics. <laughs> and it always comes back to, to this. So there was going to be a change. They were going to require that anybody that had a retirement account, um, an IRA account, a 401k account, that those advisors would have to be a fiduciary. And what happened, it was all set to go. Trump took office and he put a squash on that. So uh, it would be interesting to see to see what happens. I truly believe that that, that there'd be a, a big big place to uh, to be able to fill to be able to fill that need. So 
So let's talk a little bit about, about some other things that you mentioned in the in the chapter. I guess there is something called Regulation B one. Uh, oh, BI. That's, that's BI. It. Regulation. Sorry, Regulation BI. That you know explains kind of the differences. You want to talk sure. about that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, uh, you actually reference the quote old standard suitability before Regulation BI is. Uh, a regulation that the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC, promulgated after a comment from people and, uh, uh, everywhere from financial institutions to investment, uh, to investor advocacy groups. And the SEC knew that it was important to reform what was going on a number of years ago, which is the best interest rule. There was not enough transparency, as you just pointed out, Larry there was not enough disclosure. So it may, an investment may be quote suitable, but the, the broker or the broker dealer was maybe not disclosing enough such that there still could be a conflict of interest. And the SEC then promulgated this rule, put it out for comment and then approved it and came up with this notion of best interest. And essentially what it means is that the broker or the broker dealer has to make decisions that are in the best interest of the customer. And then the, the regulation actually specifies what that means in terms of, okay, you have to make a disclosure of this. You have to make a disclosure of that. And the way I would encapsulate everything is it's the best interest rule plus additional disclosures. Right, and that's great for the attorneys, but do you think the real the the, the layperson is really going to know the difference between best interest and fiduciary and really say, hmm, I really should be working with one versus the other? It's a fair uh, point. It's a very, very fair point, just like your point as to uh, that in today's world, with today's technology, that there if every financial professional had a financial had a fiduciary obligation, it would not result in anyone who wanted financial advice not getting it. I don't know that answer. I can say to you, it's quite understandable if a layperson would not understand the difference. And I also can say, I agree with you that I haven't seen a study in the United States as to what has happened. It's a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And so you may be aware there is a, uh, a movement of people that are still advocating for a fiduciary obligation among all financial professionals. And I, I think you're quite right as a matter of whether there is a, a, a political. So yeah. the, the bottom line to me, it comes to that the big brokerage firms fight this because they don't want to be involved in lawsuits for some of their brokers that may not do the right thing. So well, that's a good why, point. Why wouldn't everyone want to be a fiduciary? Why wouldn't the firm say, let's be a fiduciary? Well, I mean, you can be a little cynical and, and appropriately cynical, which is just the same thing for regulations of other things in society, which people may take a one position or another to. And that may be what's going on as well as other things. It's the same thing with the investment uh Companies Act, where there are those who deal with companies that have to have fiduciary mm -hmm. obligations. And part of my chapter also deals with those fiduciary claims brought against fiduciaries in what circumstances. And in fact, a broker can actually become a fiduciary. I'll give one example. If the account that they're trading on is a discretionary account, meaning they have the ability to make a trade or a purchase without the express authorization of their customer, they can become a fiduciary, rightly so. But, in, but uh, Larry, all your points are, very, are, are well taken. Yeah, so what would you like to say to uh, professionals out there, financial professionals out there? What I'd like to say is to take a page from your book, which is for those <laughs> of you, I, I mean that, you know, figuratively, figuratively and literally, but. If you are a fiduciary, it is something which differentiates you from a broker at a big house. The question is whether the customer or the client can afford it. And if, if, if they can't afford your services, that you refer them to somebody who can. 
And perhaps maybe folks like you consider different structures based on scope of services. If it's a one-time plan, then maybe a one-time fee. If it's a, a constant um, oversight of, a, of their uh, wealth from a holistic perspective, then maybe the percentage of AUM is appropriate. Absolutely. I mean, I think if we did go that way, we, 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 I mean, I'd want to make sure that there's enough services out there for everybody to be able to to participate and get and get advice. So one thing I will means, say, yeah, is it's ahead. important uh, because you and I have come to know each other and I've seen you. There's a lot of noise out there uh, in the whether it's I mean, we call it the internet, right? If some you a, a, a lay person, a retail investor, forget about whether they are day trading, but if they're simply trying to make money and they think they can do it on their own, there are so many sites from so many um, publicly available forums, which may or may not be giving advice to somebody in, that, that has the capacity to understand it. They might be recommending a, a particular company because the hedge funds, you know, maybe 53 hedge funds are invested in it, but those hedge funds are simultaneously hedging with other options and other um, things such that a retail investor is saying, oh, okay, I'm gonna purchase some company Avco. That's dangerous. Uh, we can't, but that doesn't mean we should engage in censorship. It's just a matter of educating investors. Education is key. I always say to that, it's like that old Sisims, you know, uh, commercial for uh, clothing. It's uh, an educated invest, investor is, they'll understand more when we try to educate. So what would you like to say to an investor? I'd like to say, as in everything in life, Go to good people, right? If you, you know, you add and advocate for yourself. It's the same thing. You know, I come from a medical family. My father was a, was a doctor and uh, my brother's a doctor. Just as you might go to a doctor and if you get, you feel the need for a second opinion and if that doctor says, no, I don't like that, you should definitely go to a different, different doctor. It's the same thing in life for everything. Same thing with an attorney. If an attorney is is not dealing with you and you if you feel in a way that they should go to a different one, so go to a financial professional who makes you feel comfortable, who has the background such as a CFP, someone who is certified in financial planning, um, and someone who is uh, doing the work for your benefit, and choose someone that you're comfortable with. Absolutely. I mean, I even tell people when they come looking us, feel free, go talk to other people, you know, <clears throat> find a fit. You got to find somebody that you're comfortable with. I use the doctor analogy. I basically tell clients besides the doctor, I'm going to know more about them than anyone else by asking the right questions and figuring out what they want to want to do. So it's an important, important selection if you're going to select a financial advisor plan to work to work with. And there is a, there, like any profession, I'm sure there's some bad apples out there, but there's a lot of good people that can help all, a lot of different people in a lot of different situations. Absolutely. Um, anything else you want to say about the, the, the book? How did it go writing it? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I enjoyed it very much because um, I like, uh, you know, figuring out things and making them simple. I actually uh, do get into a lot of the legal structure but then I bring it to uh, what I hope is a, an easily readable format that someone can just pick up and read. And I think that's important. I enjoyed writing it. And uh, it, I do things like this all the time with my practice. I enjoy uh, teaching fellow attorneys as well as business executives who are uh, my clients. So why don't, you let us, why don't you let our audience know where could they get the book? And if, and if somebody wants to speak to you, how would they get in, in contact with you, Stephen? Well, the book is on sale by the American Bar Association, and I doubt that many uh, uh, people listening would know where to go on the American Bar Association. Probably the best thing would be to reach out to me, and I can uh, get them uh, the, the link for it. And I'm with Mizola Lindstrom. They can just look me up on Google, Stephen Brodsky at MizolaLindstrom.com. My email is Stephen with the PH at MazzolaLindstrom.com. And my cell is 516 314 1407. 
Uh, great, Stephen. Thank you so much. I think anyone listening to this, hopefully they have a better understanding of what a fiduciary is and the differences out there. And we've gotten to that. Uh, any final thoughts, Stephen? No, I, I, my final thought is I'd like to thank you. And I think it's important like that people like you uh, bring light to these things. You and, and I. Um, it's important for for the public. Absolutely. The more the more we can educate, the more we can get the word out there, then then people can make their own decision on what's right for them. So right. uh, thank you, thank you again, Stephen, so much for uh, for joining me today. And thank you for having me, Larry. Stephen, this has been fantastic. Uh, Larry and I have talked about what a fiduciary is and the role before, but I've never heard it from an angle like yours. So thank you so much for being on the show. And of course, Larry, thank you for bringing him on the show. We bring the. Oh, uh, you're welcome, Eric. Anytime. Yeah, the best guest. Anytime, guests. and stay uh, warm. <laughs> They uh, want it. All right, Stephen, time for you to go. Uh, <laughs> so, Larry, uh, also, uh, if, if somebody wants to reach out to you to talk to you a little bit more about this, uh, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so they they can go to our website, hellowealthmanagement.com, and they can schedule a 20 minute call with myself or one of the planners right online, or they can feel free to call us at 631 248 3600. Perfect. And of course, our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Life Unlimited podcast with Larry Heller. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Larry comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with friends and family. Again, thank you for listening today. For everyone at Heller Wealth Management, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. 